Um, we are live. We're live. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Back for a second round of our unnamed thing yeah. <laughs> about interest. <laughs> This week we're talking about, um, I'm just sharing this really quick in my Facebook group. Please do. This week we're talking about digital products Mm -hmm. and interest and making the most out of that, getting some sales from your organic or paid traffic. Anything you want to add? No. I mean, I think we could maybe talk about our experiences selling our own digital products on Pinterest. Yeah. Then maybe we can give some tips and yeah. then we to do that. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Um, do you want to start? Um, okay, yeah. So I first sold um, a digital product on Pinterest in 2015. But when I did it, it was an email course with something to sell at the end. And at the time, it's kind of funny, I didn't have the intention of selling a product. I just realized I grew a list so big, so fast. You know, back in the day when Pinterest is amazing, you just put a keyword in there and you just ranked without any effort. <laughs> so I did a I did a productivity challenge, which is quite funny because I never see myself doing something like that now. <laughs> Um, and then I just sold, um, I think it was just, it was just worksheets. It was so cheap. So that time I didn't sell directly. I sold, um, at the end of the challenge. So that everyone had the challenge five days. Um, they had some little, they had some little, um, PDS on each day to help them be more productive. Then I sold like a productivity pack at the end. Um, was it really successful? Um, no, because the product wasn't that solid. <laughs> but the point is that I was still able to make sales by targeting the right people on Pinterest. And then my second product was my mini Pinterest course on Pinterest, which had a little bit more structure and foundation to, to it. And I st- started selling that on Pinterest end of last year. And that's actually been doing okay. Um, Every month consistently, I will make at least, you know, three or four sales from that. Um, But now I'm just trying to ramp it up because I just put the pins on there, which is, which is great because, you know, obviously did the right keyword and thing, but I just haven't been promoting pins to that offer, you know, a lot. So that's what I'm trying to do now. So my point being is if someone like me can create a product and you know sell it without a solid strategy on pinterest then the potential on there you know there is potential there which a lot of people don't get and yeah. i mean i want to add more but i want to wait until you give your experience and we can talk about my points after <laughs> yeah okay so my first digital product that i sold on pinterest was a course and that was three years ago on Pinterest. So because, yeah, it's three years ago um, when I started selling it. And then two years ago, I ran ads to it and sold it. It still sells. It's a, it's a product on how to use Trello as a mom. <laughs> and um, this is before Trello even got really big in the family space. Um, Trello actually picked me up for a feature on their website too, because of that product. And it was just a, like a video course. The videos are anywhere between like two to five minutes long. Mm-hmm. They show you how to use it. I give you free boards to use. Um, again, like as a mom, so in your household, so meal planning, going paperless, uh, you know, project planning for your like DIY projects, things like that. And I think it did pretty well. Um, I created blog post content for it, which is what ultimately sold it. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be really helpful in selling digital products in bulk, at least for the B2C space. Um, Business owners, it might be a little bit different because we know people are selling a product. Mm -hmm. 
but consumers may not understand that there is something there to be sold. Mm -hmm. The psychology is different. Um, I don't, maybe not all the time, but yeah, I, I think I did pretty well. I ran an ad two years ago to this. I started the ad, it ran for six weeks. I started it when I left for a vacation. I'm gonna be gone for um, a couple weeks. The vacation was gonna butt up to an eye surgery. So we were gonna be out of signal and out of pocket for that time frame that I was running the ad. And then I ended up spending a hundred dollars and I made 500. That's really good. On a $17 product. That's really good. And I love the fact that you said it was how, you know, how to travel for moms which goes back to something that we were covering last week you need to tailor your content to the person and not talk about the product itself because I'm sure that if you try to sell um a course that was just like how to use Trello it may have sold but not as much as the course that you created which was Trello for months yeah so it it's was really niche yeah, exactly. And it's really important to add context around what you're selling. And that's what differentiates you mm -hmm. from everybody else on Pinterest. Yeah. And I think that even of me, um, like I said, when I start, did that productivity challenge, things were completely different on Pinterest. You know, yeah. There were the times. And I was able to grow a list of 3,000 in a very short span of time. Um, compared to what you can do now with just organic traffic. Um, however, I do feel that if it was um, a productivity challenge for moms or if I said productivity challenge for single parents or whatever it is, it would have probably done better on Pinterest because, you know, generally people um, are looking for those things, you know, tips for moms, tips for single yeah. parents, you know, tip for, tips for keto people, whatever, you know, they, they, I wouldn't say they're always specific, but those niche search terms generally tend to do better. Yeah, I think what set me apart for this particular product, and this still sells, um, I don't do anything with that website anymore, um, is I took something that people were looking for and I changed the delivery method. Mm -hmm. It's something different than what they're used to seeing. We're all on our cell phones. We have them on us all the time. We're absolutely obsessed. So taking something like that and kind of flipping the script and making it different, it's not printables, which people were used to. It's not recipe books or anything like that. Like I'm literally showing you how to take what you're already doing and making it better. Um, so I think that's really important when you're doing research on digital products. Um, I know funnel hacking is really popular right now. I'm not like, I'm still on the fence about it. I'm not really a huge fan of going through people's entire funnels and reading their copy because I feel like it it um, kind of formulates my mindset around like what yeah. I should be doing and the copy I should be writing and mm -hmm. I don't want it to inspire anything I'm doing but just even if you look at people's landing pages and see what they're offering to see how you can do it better maybe don't go through the entire funnel um because there's just some ethical stuff there I'm not a huge fan of. But yeah, um, that's definitely what I did when I created that product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it works. I mean, what would be your top tips for somebody who is creating a digital product today? Start simple mm -hmm. and just test it. Put it out there. It doesn't matter how beautiful it is. You could even beta test something if you wanted to beta test it if you're afraid of it or pre-sell it, like you don't even have it created yet, like create a landing page and a cart and make it clear that you are launching this new thing and you are actively like, give it a date of when it's gonna be done. Um, I've seen that be successful some, for some clients. Uh, there's a meal planning client that I have that they were launching a monthly membership for $5 for meal plans. Mm -hmm. And they're not ready yet, but we're still putting it out into the world because Pinterest takes a while to pick up steam. I need to put this down so I don't stab myself in the eyeball. Um, but yeah, there's different ways that you can go about it. I just think starting, start with what you have and work your way out. You don't need fancy funnel builders and tech. I still very much use lead pages with a cart, which is 
my cart is Access Ally because I build all my courses on my site. Um, but you could use Thrivecart and Lead Pages and ConvertKit. Those three things could easily get you, you know, a product yeah. out in the world. You could use something free like Elementor if you don't want to pay for a page builder. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I have mine at the moment is Elementor and it does absolutely fine. And I've used ClickFunnels. Um, I still use ClickFunnels um, for some of my clients and all other things, but you don't have to get started. And one thing I love is the fact that ConvertKit are now coming out with their own e-commerce solution. They are? they are. You have to sign up for it to be um, notified when they launch on the 15th of this month but they are coming out of an e-commerce solution. It's just for digital products. But, you know, if you're using ConvertKit, you don't really need anything else. I mean, you've got, you've got the ConvertKit for your list building and you have the ConvertKit to sell your digital product. I mean, I think for me, um, one of my tips would be put a pin directly to the product and also create a tripwire. Those would be my two things. I'd say put a pin directly to the product because there are going to be some people that are ready to buy straight away. Um, but you may get, may get some that are more um, enticed by free offer. Then if in the thank you page, you make them an offer to, you know, to um, enhance the learning experience by paying X amount, you can get more leads that way. So I would try and target more people because you have nothing to lose if you have an offer on your thank you page yeah you know so that would be that would be one of my advice and um i would say even if you're going to start simple have that email sequence have that oh. email sequence because um i think one of my mentors mentors is actually saying that she had a her client had 110 people go through an abandoned cart sequence um they signed up for a lead magnet whatever but they didn't purchase from that sequence 84 people purchased I'm actually working on this piece myself. I have an abandoned cart sequence where I send them a coupon code mm -hmm. and I'm telling you my tricks. Uh, so if you go through any of my products and you start the process, then you will be presented with something enticing to bring you back. Um, Cause I do notice with my digital Pinterest products, I do have a higher abandoned cart rate than I would like. And I'm not really sure what that is just yet because I haven't taken the time to dig into landing pages and my emails work really well. I have almost a 40% open rate. Um, my average across the board open rate is 36%, which is fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, I think I have to work on that a little bit more, but I like that you said that. Um, and it depends on what you use, hopefully. If convert kit like their platform will have that feature i'm sure it will because it's all tagging based i'm sure yeah but with access ally i have that tag base so when they start an order if it doesn't continue mm -hmm. and the tag added for main purchase isn't added to their profile then after like so many hours it triggers an email saying hey did you forget something come back yeah I, I definitely think that's important and you can get a lot more people back that way. And um, another tip I would say is if you are someone who's selling digital products and you have an intention to run ads, well, Pinterest ads, I would get the Pinterest tag installed um, as soon as possible. Yeah. So it starts, yeah, so it can start doing its thing of seeing the kind of people that are going to your offers and signing up and making a purchase. So when you yeah. are ready, to run Pinterest ads, it, it will take a lot long, le, not a lot longer. It won't take as long as it would do to find the ad your clients than if you're running ads and it had no history at all. So that's something I would definitely do. Yeah, I think that's important. I actually keep all my pixels in a Google Doc. So every time I create a new page, I just paste them right in. Yeah, that's what I do in Airtable. I've got all my tracking codes in Airtable. And then when I like like you, when I create a new page, um, actually for for my elementary site, I actually have Google um, Tag Manager. So oh, okay. it'll, yeah, it'll pick all my pages. So what I have to do is, if it's a new a specific page, I'll add a custom conversion on there. 
Um, and if it was a new thank you page, I just make sure I add the um, thank you tag on there or the lead or whatever tag you want. I like the only thing is custom conversions on Pinterest ads at the moment is very weak. So if you set up custom conversions, you can't see um, the tracking for a specific custom conversion in the dashboard. It would just be one column for custom conversions and you're just assuming that it's the conversion that you set up. So yeah, but other than that, yeah, I definitely do the same thing. Have a checklist of what happens every time you create a new offer. These are those pixels that need to go on the page. You know, these are the values, etc. So yeah, I definitely do the same thing. And then if, so what I do for my digital products, my digital Pinterest products right now, I have my main small product, which is $27 if you buy it. And then if it, I have the same product on a tripwire for that, if you're running ads, make sure you have two different thank you pages so you can properly track values because you don't want to be running an ad and have people coming in at 27 and people coming in at 17 because undoubtedly I've got people coming from both avenues. So I just duplicate the pages. I make it the first round, the main landing page and thank you page. And then I just duplicate it and change the value mm -hmm. and put a timer on the tripwire to make the scarcity um, there. Yeah. And then I have two funnels essentially. Yeah. With like with just maybe 10 minutes of extra work for duplicating and changing pixel value. Exactly. And, and then, the same as well, if you were using something like Thrivecart, have two order forms, one for the quick, fast action bonus price. Yep. And then you'll have your standard price. And then we were, we were talking the other day about using tools at a deadline funnel to make sure that nobody can go back. Um, yes. Because it's not that we're trying to use scarcity. I mean, fake scarcity. We're just trying to, um, what's the word? What's the word? Um, reward people for taking action immediately. I think action. That's yep. They are. And then something else that I don't, I think a lot of people fail at doing is nurturing their buyers. You need a specific email sequence to nurture your buyers. And then if you don't like after a certain point, it, doesn't matter. I email all of the people on my list, um, yeah. but they get a specific buyer sequence after they buy to help them implement the product mm -hmm. and then nurture them towards another product because it's cheaper to turn more, pro turn more buyers into, you know, repeat buyers than it is to go out and find new ones. Yep. So I think that's something a lot of people miss. It doesn't need to be complicated. This is something I complicated for myself for far too long was the email sequences. Mm -hmm. What should my email say? And then I would just put it off and put it off. When in reality, I was using templates that I found online for free. Now I've purchased other templates and I paid for them. Mm -hmm. Both the paid and free templates, the open rates are better than industry average. So it just depends, like you need to nurture your people. Yeah. And let them know that you're going to be there. I think, um, I know for me personally, when my sequence includes an email about support, you know, just encouraging them, let, letting them know that I want them to succeed with the product. I've noticed that email in my sequence actually got a lot of responses because people appreciate the fact that I actually cared about the outcome that they achieve mm -hmm. from finishing the um, product. And I do, I really do. And those are the same people, when I give them an idea of a product I wanna launch, they're like, invoice me. I'm like, but I haven't even, you know, figured out a price or anything. They're like, just invoice me. And that's what you want by building that relationship. These people don't know me from Adam, you know, yes, they purchased a product from me, but they don't know me personally. But from that onboarding sequence, you're definitely increasing the lifetime value of your customers just by letting them know, hey, I'm here. I want to support you. And they're going to want to buy from you because they feel that level of support. So, yeah, I definitely think that it's really important to look at the, the whole of the existing client relationship and not that not just the point when they become a client, when they've made that initial purchase. So. Definitely agree. Definitely. So I think for starting out, if you're if you're watching this and you don't have a tripwire or you don't have a small digital product that you're selling, you need a landing page for the product. To, it's like a sales page. It doesn't need to be like this huge long thing. 
I think my sales pages for my small products are like a scroll and a half. Um, so you need a landing page to sell the product, a thank you page to either as a tripwire upsell the product or to thank them for purchasing. Um, so if you're doing, let's just start with the small product straight to sales page. So sales page, thank you page, buyer email sequence, which you'll deliver the product in. You're going to need an order form for so some sort of cart. And then did I say the email sequence? I think I did. So mm -hmm. Like four basic things, right? Mm -hmm. And then of course, pins, create pins to send to that. For your tripwire stack, if you have a free to tripwire, thank you. I will promise I will cut your peach up when I'm done. Okay. Um, <laughs> for your free to tripwire stack, you need a free landing page giving away something free. And we should probably talk about that yeah. a little bit um, mm -hmm. because this is, there's some confusion here too. So you need a freebie page where they'll sign up for the free thing, the tripwire page, which is the thank you page selling the, yeah. the product, the email sequence for the free thing. And then if they buy the thing, you're going to need an email sequence mm -hmm. to deliver that. And I think that's it. Um, if you're going for the scarcity, you want a countdown timer for the yeah. thank you page? Yeah. Um, that's about it. I mean, there's so one of the things that I, I'm assuming that you're going to get to was the differences between the um, product page if you're going to be using a freebie at the front. So you just want to make sure that um, when you have your low cost offer, you duplicate that page and you make that the landing page when somebody has signed up for the freebie. But what you want to do is just add a message at the top, like, you know, your freebie's on the way. Um, but whilst you're waiting, here's a special one time offer. Don't use those words as a terrible, but. Yeah. You get my point. You just want to add a message at the top to let them know that what they asked for is actually on the way, but you want to present them with a one-time offer. Whether you want to say it's irresistible, you know, you know, want this price you'll only see it once or whatever it is. You you find that hook that works for your business, and then you have your sales page underneath. So obviously the um, top is going to be a bit different for both the standalone product page and the tripwire product page. Selling the same yeah. product, you just, you know, you just want to have that message because one thing that may happen is if you don't add that message in the top is people might think, I sign up for freebie, where, where is it? Why am I seeing this product page? You know, so just acknowledge that they are getting what they asked for, um, but now you want to give them this offer. And I think one thing that we need to address is that when you are making this paid offer, it needs to be something that can um, that is a better way of doing what you're giving them for free. So yeah. maybe like, for example, let's take your Trello board, for example, maybe you had a PDF of um, how to organize your life as a mom and signed up. You'd be like, hey, you know, but for $27, I'm going to give you a much faster way. I'll give you these digital board that you can carry around with you, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it's usually, you know, $37, but if you order right now, you can have it for, you know, $17, $27, whatever it is. So, you know, make it, make it, um, you need to make it irresistible enough for them to want to take action now. You can't have the same price as you would in a normal page because as far as they're concerned, they can come back and purchase it whenever they want. And that's the beauty of using something like Deadline Funnel. Now, I know there's a lot of tech savvy people out there, but let's face it, not everybody is. So when you use Deadline Funnel, it will stop people from being able to go to that page um, to purchase at the lower end offer, and they will have no choice but to purchase um, the higher priced offer. Now, like I said, it's, it's not, you know, it's not solid. There's ways around it. You know, I'm sure we all know them. If you don't, I'm not telling you. <laughs> But um, yeah, that's um, that's what you need to. You just need to make sure that it's positioned correctly, and the offer that you are making makes sense. It will not do well if it's completely unrelated to the free offer that you are making. So it's yeah. not just about offering something for the sake of offering something because we said so. It's offering something because you believe by paying your by your customer paying for this, they will achieve a much better result than they would if they just relied on the freebie alone. So maybe a speed, if they buy your tripwire, you're going to get them, you're going to get them a result a lot faster. Or maybe it's if they buy this tripwire, they're going to make a lot more money than they would do if they just followed your free advice or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it is, but make sure that 
it's a no-brainer. They're like, do you know what? I have to buy this now. It makes so much sense. Yep. I actually think I need to rename. I'm thinking about it right now. Mm -hmm. And I think I need to rename my Tripwire product. Mm -hmm. Because right now my free to Tripwire is the freebie is a Pinterest strategy guide, which is like I walk you through what to do to stay consistent mm -hmm. with the Pinterest strategy. And then the Tripwire offer is a strategy that I usually walk all my strategy clients through minus the custom one-on-one -on -one support or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's that framework of building your Pinterest strategy and implementing it. And I think there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have people buying it, but I think there might be a little bit of a disconnect. I'm gonna test this out. Yeah. And that's the beauty, just test things out. You know, um, unfortunately for Pinterest, it's there is there is a you know, a kind of framework but that framework doesn't go the same way for everybody, you know? So like, for example, one of the things Pinterest say is be consistent. Pinterest has never said how many times you should pin a day. Someone made up this rule 30 pins a day. I won't lie, when I was new to Pinterest, I fell for it. I have to pin 30 pins a day, but it's not. Because consistently for one brand could be them pinning um, two pins a day and they're doing just as fine. But for maybe another brand, they have to pin, you know, 20 pins a day to, you know, to achieve, um, you know the same type of success for their business you know and like for pin design we have some we know that the light of more feminine colors you know work well one of the things that you know Pinterest want to see is like brand um consist consistency congruency fair enough but then for some brands maybe green is a color that works really well for them and they're going to continue to do that and for others it's going to be pink so and this is why this is what we discussed last week right we said we don't tell people what to do in our courses it's a it's a framework that we know if you follow, you do well, but then you have to tailor that framework to your business, you know? Exactly. So, um, you know, for what's so, up, you know, the reason why I'm saying that is because we have said to you, okay, you know, you need, you know, it's great to have the lead magnet and then, um, you know, a trip buyer page, but we won't say you need to price it at this. I mean, I think we could both agree. There's a, there's a trend on the industry point. average. Of yeah. What? we've seen work exactly yeah exactly there's an average there but we won't say okay you need to price it at 37 dollars you need to figure that out so you know with Heva testing her offer is just, you know one of is one of those things she's going to test if making it more congruent offers more congruent will will work and maybe what she has now is is working really good and what she is going to test isn't going to work good but the point is you need to test these things because there is a set there are set things that we say do better on Pinterest but it won't necessarily do better for you. One of my clients is doing exceptionally well with five pins a day. I've got another one who insists of doing more pins than that a day. And I'm trying to explain to him that pinning more pins a day is not helping his, is not helping the strategy at all. Okay. So we're just wasting, we're just wasting a lot more resources trying to keep up with the fresh pins he wants per day. You need to look at your numbers and look at what makes sense and optimize based on what you see and then make judgments from there. And the same is true with your digital products. So if you start a digital product funnel and you put it up, what I like to monitor are my opt-ins and I divide that out by how many people have purchased, have taken up, taken my offer to purchase the upsell. So then I have kind of a number I can run off of there. And then I look at my email open rates and see for that email sequence, where are people clicking on the links and what have they clicked on because ConvertKit can tell you by email like what people clicked on mm -hmm. and then the open rates for the whole sequence so each email has an open rate and a click rate mm -hmm. where are people falling off and then I can take that and change out that email and test something different yeah and that, just watching those few things can give you a lot of insight into what you need to work on um so really it all comes back to the analytics, which a lot of people just don't like to look at and read or they don't know how, or they say they don't know how and they're just scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, another thing is don't base your judgment on a sample size too small. So what I mean is if you've only had five people go through your funnel and all five didn't buy, do not use that as an indication of the success of that offer because simply put not enough people have gone through that funnel for you to decide whether it's a bad offer or not 
you know yeah. maybe it's your first five that just didn't buy and you're next to that purchase so I normally say um don't make any judgment calls until you've had maybe at least 100 people um obviously the more people you can get through the funnel the better judgment you can make but at least wait until like 100 people have at least hit your landing page before you decide whether this funnel um, needs to be changed. And I mean, we can we can have a whole another session about tracking because there's so many things you can do to track different things. You can try user experience, you can track bounce rate, you know, all those things do make a difference. Um, I do like to look at the user experience. I wanna know what are people doing when they go to my page? Um, mm -hmm. Are they even clicking on the buy now button? If they're not clicking on the buy now button, why not? Are they reading the whole sales page? If not, where are they dropping off? Why are they dropping off? Maybe my copy's crap. Maybe I need to change that. But you need to have enough people go through that in order for you to make judgment. And you need to ensure that you have data to back up your, you know, your theory. Don't say your course is crap if you cannot give me an educated reason as to why your course is crap. If you came to me and said, hey, Rose, I don't think my course is good because people have read the whole sales page, but nobody has, um, you know, purchased, you know, clicked on the buy now button. And I can tell this because I'm using, you know, mouse click, whatever you call it, or Hotjar. And this is what the data from Hotjar um, mouse and all mouse flow is telling me. Then we can have a look at that. Then we can see what tweets you can make. Another thing you want to make sure you're doing is you only want to test one thing at a time. Don't change everything because then you won't know what was responsible um, for the increased conversion or decreased conversions. So in the example that I just gave that nobody's clicking the button, maybe the first thing I say is, hey, okay, let's try and make the button a little bit more appealing for people. Maybe change the words, maybe change the color, maybe change the size. Then we'll test that for whether, whether it's 30 days or until 100 people go for the funnel again, whichever one makes more sense. Then we look at the figures again. If people are clicking and not buying, then maybe, okay, then if people click and not buying, is it the order page? Um, that's the problem now. This is how you tweak a funnel. And I mean, I think that the internet marketing world has done a very bad job of showing people how much work actually goes into making a funnel work. They are funnels that work straight away. Do not get me wrong. I'm not saying that they are lying, but I'm saying that they don't give um, a whole picture of maybe how many losses they had before that one funnel worked, you know, or how much work put into making that, fun that funnel work or how long it took to test, you know? So I don't want you to get too caught up thinking, well, I saw someone who launched a funnel in a month and it started working. It's not like that for everybody. And I can guarantee you that it's a majority of people that have to test it a few times before it works. Nobody likes to talk about the work. They like to um, talk about the overnight successes that maybe took X amount of years. I mean, I just got an email from somebody that I follow who said it took them 12 years to get the first $100,000, you know? And in today's society, exactly. Yeah, and um, for today's world, maybe a lot of people are thinking, well, why did it take you so long? Do you know? But the reality of the matter for a lot of for a lot of people, it is it is just taking that long. I mean, I was able to um, when I started my business. I started my business out of a need. I had degenerate, found out I had degenerative back, um, disc disease. I couldn't go back to work, so I I started um messing about things in 2015 September 2016 I eventually went all in after quitting in February 2016 and I haven't had a job ever since and I've been okay with that whereas there's some people who are in a nine-to-five who are still been up the business because they cannot leave the business it doesn't mean that they are I am any better than them that's just what it takes them to do to get to where they want to be so we really do need to stop this comparison and I really feel that this has happened especially on Pinterest especially with the incorrect misinformation I have five million reach but they're not showing the clicks so and again if you watched last week's live I said I had a client who had millions of reach but when I looked at her number she had 100 people go into her website before we start working with one another so it just goes that that information is very misleading so this is why you have to set your own benchmarks and judge yourself based on your past success not what you see everybody else is doing because I guarantee you probably don't have the whole story especially when it comes to Pinterest yeah well one way I tested mine to get an accurate benchmark was I created the funnel which that alone took months to do Mm -hmm. creating and testing, creating and testing and finding all of the little broken pieces or the missing little Lego blocks. And so in January, when I had it all finished and I was ready to go, I joined a Facebook ads uh, intensive mm -hmm. and um, worked 
like in the intensive on my stuff as I was getting coached to do it all. And I found out through this process that I needed to make my page better. So I got help with that, made the page better. And then we started running ads by like the third or fourth week of actually it was like two months in, I think we were two months in, it was a three month intensive. It was when I moved into my house here in March, I started my ads Mm -hmm. and then I figured out that it was actually working really well. By the time I had made all of those tweaks, the funnel was going. So it was a good six months in, I would say, between creating the products, starting building the funnels, tweaking everything, and then putting it out into the world. It was a good six months. And I have on that opt-in page, when I run ads to it, mm-hmm. almost 92% opt-in rate. That's crazy. Fantastic. And then my tripwire sales rate is 25%. Which is huge, huge. Because you took that time, you didn't feel rushed. And to be honest, I think the actual building of the funnel is the fastest part. It's the tweaking. (laughs) It takes me so long. I even use template pages, Rose, template pages. And I still end up taking like an entire day because I get, it takes me longer, not necessarily to build the pages, but to figure out the customer language. Mm-hmm. Which is what a lot of people miss. And I like the fact you said that because um, I think that's what I was going to cover before is when as business owners, and I'm guilty of this because I struggle with words. I just always have, which is funny because when I was in school, I was wrote with the most likely to become an author. So the irony but (laughs) um what we do as business owners and I find this is this is the same across most industries and um Julie Stone one of my coaches actually validated this as well is we normally use our language which is not the same language that your ideal clients are using therefore they don't connect with our offers um a lot for example a blogger who's looking to use Pinterest for business um maybe they're like I want to use Pinterest to um, increase my my AdSense, my AdSense traffic or payments or whatever. And as a business owner, if we just say how to use Pinterest to grow your business, it's not going to engage them as much as if you had a piece of content that said how a new blogger can grow their reach by, you know, to, by 10,000 page views in under six months. You know, now a new blogger's thinking you can do that okay, I want to do that, show me. And in fact, I have a free email sequence where I actually had an example of somebody doing that, how as a new blogger, you can grow your paid views to 10,000, how you can grow your blog traffic to 10,000 paid views a month. You know, that's got to a specific person and that would, in my head, would always convert more than than creating an image that says how to um, use traffic, how to use Pinterest to grow your traffic. Now, don't get me wrong, they are people... That, you know, we all know that you have a sales funnel, you should understand your customer's journey, what they're going through. But you also have to understand that not everybody is going to go through that same customer journey. So when you're creating content, think about every aspect of that journey. So there'll be some people that are out there looking for a course. So you can have a pin that says, um, download this quick and easy course for $27. You know, those are the people that want to buy an app, that don't want to do research. I'm always there when I have a solution in my head. A lot of the times, I'm not deciding unless it's a high price point. If it's a low price point, you give me an offer, I will buy it straight away. I don't need to be nurtured. So you can have content for those people. Then you've got the people that may be deciding, um, you know, um, deciding what course to take. Then maybe for that person, you'd have a comparison blog post. And at the end of the blog post, you would give your solution. You know, you've given them the options and then you've told them what, why yours is the best option. If they believe you, they will buy. So think about every chat, every aspect of that customer journey and create content for that customer journey and remember it can all go to the exact same product all you're doing is changing the delivery but the product is always the same but because you're fo- you're taking the focus away from your product and you're putting it on the customer you've now opened up a wider audience because you've created different pieces of um, entry points into that course I think that's great and I'm actually working on this myself for my Pinterest stuff mm-hmm. because my methods can be used across industries. So creating, my nose is so itchy, I'm sorry. Mine is my eye, you can see me rough. <laughs> um, so like Pinterest for direct sales, Pinterest for 
X, Y, Z, right? So I have something for everyone because like a direct salesperson is not going to resonate with blogging. Like they don't think about that. Yes. So creating those, I think that's really a good point and mm -hmm. something that I have on my own to-do list of like the content and the journey and where they start. The top of funnel is going to look different. Mm -hmm. Bottom of the funnel can look the same. Yeah. And I have a friend who's a coach and she sells mostly high ticket and she's, she's on Pinterest doing exceptionally well. But when you look at her content, it's, um, she has different entry points. She has the funnel webinar funnel, and then she has a blog post. But what she's done is she knows she's a, um, she taught, teaches people to become a coach, but she also knows there's different types of coaches. So on her pins, it's, she's got a generic one, how to become a successful coach. Then she's got how to become a mindset coach, you know, how to become a, you know, health coach. She's, you know, she's obviously done her research in the, in the top coach searches on Pinterest. And she's created a pin for all of those, but they all go back to the same blog post. And at the end of that blog post, it's a call to action to join her webinar. And she's doing freakingly well. <laughs> That's a nice word for it. She's doing really, really well just by doing that. So you don't have to overcomplicate things. And the thing is, this doesn't just work for digital, um, like digital product that we're talking. You know, this coach client, her, her, this coach friend, her course is three and a half thousand dollars. It actually works for service providers as well. That is how I started gaining traction, and that's how my business started. It was from Pinterest, from a blog post about how to get started on Pinterest. And there was something because I think it was about productivity. And, and when I started, I was a VA. So the woman that hired me, she's actually another successful person who does well on Pinterest. She hired me because I had shown proof from my blog post that I'm the kind of person that she would want to hire. So she put a call with me. She's like, I would love to work with you. You know, we had that discovery call and she was sold. She was sold because of a blog post. I got a client and she stayed with me for nearly I think she stayed with me for nearly 12 months we parted away because I felt I felt pregnant and my pregnancies are horrendous I couldn't I just couldn't work so you know it just goes to show um it doesn't just work for digital just focus on your customer and I think it's something when you have a lot of people who try to use Pinterest when they're desperate to make money this is where the frustration comes because you get frustrated that you're not making a sale in a week. You get frustrated because your pins are not working. But a lot of the times, it's just this one simple thing you need to change. Take the focus away from your product and put it on your customer. And it will take time because some people in the beginning of the customer journey are not ready to buy. They're going to take some time to buy. And there's only very few that um, are ready to, you know, to um, buy straight away. Mind you, the pin that's driving me the most sales from my Pinterest course are the direct, are the direct to sell pins. It says best Pinterest course or whatever it was, $27. That is what's bringing, bringing them all sales. So I know the people that are coming to me already know that they want to buy it. So maybe for you, uh, after looking at your data, you will see, oh, maybe it's my direct to sell pins that I do better. Let me do more of that. But you need to tackle all those pinpoints to see which one works for you, you know, which one works for you the best. You can't make an assumption. You have to be patient and you have to speak your audience's language. So do that research. Go into the Facebook groups. Reddit, I love Reddit um, because people speak their true mind. <laughs> See what they're saying. Quora is another one. Um, and Quora, again, used well. You can get leads. I use Quora to get leads if I'm on there answering questions. You know, so look at the language they're using. What are the questions that people are asking? You make your pin title the answer to that question or that question. As long as the search is on, um, as long as you can see the search um, terms on Pinterest, just be smart and just spend a little bit more time on that avatar and identifying the needs. And then I definitely think that will make a drastic difference in your Pinterest strategy. And remember that um, I have a hummingbird right in front of me. I can't hear. Right out my window. Um, Remember that your um, product and your positioning and your sales is not about you at all. People don't care about Heather. They don't care about what I have to say. They care about themselves. So you need to put it on them. Show them the benefits of what they're going to get. What does life look like after mm -hmm. implementation or after they buy? Um, that is something that a lot of people miss when they're building that bridge mm -hmm. and make it all about themselves, all about me, me, me. This is what I did. Mm -hmm. what about Some, 
Yeah, and sometimes those, this is what I did, pins inspire, you know, and Pinterest is all about inspiration. You know, you want to create content that's going to want to help people take action. Yep, we get that. Um, you know, but the point is, like Heather was saying, maybe someone doesn't want to know what you did. They want to know what you can do for them. So this goes back to the split testing. So for all those that are worried about the new rule that, you know, well, it's not even a new rule, it's been a rule. It was just really um, emphasized this year about creating, exactly creating multiple pins for an image. You have, by from your research, you should have all the questions and touch points of your customer. So, you know, for those that want to hear what you did, you can have the how I did this and how you can too. You know, for those that, you know, want it to be about them, show them how they can solve a specific issue. And I'm not sure if you've heard of the why exercise, Heather, where you ask people why five times to get to the root of, you know, what they want. So, you know, from the face of it, it may appear that somebody wants to make more money, but keep asking them why to find out why it is that they want to make more money. And you may find it's because they want to be home with the children more, they want to spend more time with the children or um, because they want to travel more with their children. You know, so if your if your content was hard to make, you know, money online, it could be how I was able to um, travel with my child for, um, how I was able to travel with my child for the last 12 months and how you can too. Then on the blog post, obviously you need to make sure you address what you've said in the pin and then go about how you did it. And then if you have a call to action, don't forget your call to action. This is where a lot of you are slipping. When people come to me for a printer's audit, how can I improve, improve my conversions? You have an opportunity at the end of each blog post to promote a relevant um, pin. I don't use pop-ups on my website. I have, I don't even have any, since I redid my website, I don't have any, um, opt-ins anyway which is really bad this is something I'm working on this week but when I did have opt-ins the top um place for people to opt in to my content was at the bottom of my blog post that was where I received my most leads it was more than my landing pages it was the bottom because they've read the information they loved it and they want to hear from you more and you make sure when you collect the email address you deliver so give make sure you have that welcome sequence so they can find out obviously more about you and why you were the right person to help them and then you know how you're going to help them have that welcome sequence so they don't get cold I did that before I had I think I I had a had an opt-in to just download um join the um opt-in to get weekly marketing news and I sent them nothing absolutely Nobody nothing that. yeah they don't like that because they're now wondering what has she done with my email address? I don't trust her. So make sure if you're going to do that, you have that opt-in and the welcome sequence. So you see all of these entry points. So as you've probably been able to tell from the conversation we had so far, selling on Pinterest doesn't just mean creating a pin to a product page. It could mean creating a pin to take your blog post to sign up for something um, and having a tripwire or creating a blog post with the actual offer within the content or at the end of the blog post, you understanding the different entry points that your clients are taking to buy this product. And this is where a lot of people are failing because I think it's as easy just putting the pin and going away. And then all of a sudden printed on the work is crap, it's a waste of time. And yes, it, do, it doesn't work for some businesses. I won't lie to you and say it works for all of them. Um, but be strategic, you know, think about what you're doing and why you're doing it and think about why you're not receiving results and then think about what you can do. And I mean, I think we've, uh, we've given them enough tips to take today sure. to, to create a tripwire and create a Pinterest strategy. It's not the same as all the other platforms. Remember that people are finding you by searching. You have people that have a presence on Pinterest without having a profile because somebody's pinned content they found from their website and therefore they're getting that trend from Pinterest. So again, it's not about your profile on Pinterest. Um, it's good to optimize it in case someone is searching by profile. But our, our point is, if you put in that legwork, like Heather said, no one cares who you are. They're looking at the result, you know, the outcome you're promising them on that pin before they click through. So if you're just offering a product without promising them anything, yes, it will probably be hard to sell. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, so good. Okay, so <laughs> I think you were, uh, if you're watching this and you're interested in doing a small product, either whether it's a tripwire model or straight to sales page, which I always suggest you just do both, like create the funnel, duplicate it, and then set it up, right? As a tripwire. Your action this week is just to do, probably to start with your customer research, not even creating your product or the funnel yet. It's just figuring out 
what those pain points are. And I think if you already have an email list or a following on social media that is engaged, Mm -hmm. it's going to them and asking them what they're, what they are in need of right now. And maybe you seed, see, this is the ask method coming in where, um, you, you come up with like four to five ideas Mm -hmm. of what you want to create and you seed those to your people and let them tell you Mm -hmm. out of those, what you, what they would want from you. So I think that's probably their action item this week is getting to know what that pain point is. Mm -hmm. So you can begin the process of creating the funnel. Yeah. So once you, if you do the R survey, um, as um, Heather's mentioned, go onto Pinterest and take some of the words that people are using from those, from that survey and see what comes up. So yeah. maybe you're a, you know, a coach helping people um, change their, their eating habits. Maybe go to Pinterest and type in how to get healthy, how to eat healthy, look at the imp pins that are coming up, you know, and seeing if your, if your idea has potential on Pinterest. And then, you know, you can try some of the ideas right at the bat and you can, you can use some based on keyword research. They, look, they are sometimes I put a pin on Pinterest with that keyword research and it does really well. Um, yeah. So you can test both, do, do some, op, you know, optimized pins, which is always the best way to go. But then sometimes they are hidden searches that you don't see. So sometimes just by adding a pin without that keyword research with exactly how you see it in your mind, will we let you to see what works and then you can create more of that. So do, yep. yeah, do that. And this should be done really before you even start using Pinterest. Mm-hmm. Start with your people. Yeah. Then build your funnel. Don't build your funnel and then try to sell it you got to start with your people first exactly gosh yes. we've got so much a oh lot. Still bucks today <laughs> we're gonna go eat because we have to run to the dentist yeah and if you guys have any um comments or feedback please let us know and as always um give us a follow give us a thumbs up it helps us yeah and leave the, leave your questions so give us content ideas for next week <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We're always open for your input. We want to know how to help you. That's us finding out what you want. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And not just, I mean, the first we just winged it really because it was an idea. But now, you know, we're looking at what people are saying and then we're basing our, our lives on that. Yep. So yeah, okay. Um, Heather, do you want to tell them where to find you before we go? HeatherFerris.com And it's RosieDoesDigital.com And... We'll be back next week at 1 p.m. Yes. Back to regular schedule. Yes. 1 p.m. EST next week. So bye, guys.